first of all, congratulations to uh, Bill for uh, what is obviously a, a wonderful idea and uh, a very well executed idea. This has uh, been a terrific day so far. I've known Bill, by the way, since uh, he had brown hair, not gray hair, and uh, wasn't Dr. Shotek. He was a student when I first met him. What I'm going to talk about is uh, some of the environmental issues that have been important in terms of water resources in the province over the past two or three decades. I'm calling them the big three here. There's many other issues that are relevant, of course, but I'm picking the, the three that I perceive of as dominating the interests of the scientists and the public over the past almost three decades. Uh, let's see. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's also supposed to be a, a very small laser pointer there. Mercury, mercury has been an issue in the province for more than three decades. Mercury, particularly with respect to the fisheries in the province, uh, this issue began in the first became noticeable in the 70s and was an issue all the way through the, the 20th century and remains an issue. In fact, its importance is increasing in the attention it's getting, both scientifically and otherwise, is on the rise in the last few years and is going to rise further. Acid rain was an issue that first uh, reared its head uh, in a very small way in the 60s local problems in places like Sudbury, but over the late 70s and through all of the 80s and part of the 90s was, a, was an issue over a broader part of the province. It's something we haven't heard much about in the last 10 years, partly under the, uh, I think, partially misguided assumption that it's a problem that's been solved, uh, which I'm going to address here. And then finally, the problem of the last five years, the one that you can't avoid reading about in the paper almost every day now, there's something related to climate change. And there has been for about five years, although those in the scientific community will recognize that what we're hearing now is what we were warned about 25 years ago by the climatologists. So what I'm going to do is give a very brief update on the situation with mercury, uh, an equally brief update on acid rain. And I want to explain why these two problems are linked together and why, even more importantly, they're both linked to the phenomena of climate change. Or I subtitle this, Why We Can't Solve Environmental Problems One at a Time. What is mercury? First of all, mercury is an element. Mercury is not a compound. It, it is an element number 80 in the periodic table, if, if those of you are interested. Uh, but being an element means that it's a fundamental uh, component of matter. It cannot be broken down. We cannot get rid of mercury. The best we can do is control its distribution and its effects there's no way we can ever get rid of it. This is, by the way, mercury has some unique properties, one of them being incredibly heavy. Uh, this, that was an actual billiard ball floating in a, a, a glass of mercury. There are natural sources of mercury, particularly volcanoes. Uh, there's a little tiny amount in some rock that is gradually dissolved in the water that flows through it and over it. Uh, it is commercially mined from a mineral called cinnabar and because it accumulates in biological organisms and uh, including forests and sometimes these are burnt, that material is re-released back into the environment. However, the human sources outweigh these natural sources rather 
drastically. Uh, fossil fuel power plants, for one, are a major source of mercury in our environment. Uh, right there is an obvious link to acid rain because they are also the primary source of, of sulfur oxides which make acid rain. And waste treatment plants, wastewater treatment plants, also are significant mercury sources for a number of reasons. Incinerators, uh, because we use products that contain mercury and these end up, a lot of medical waste products contain mercury. These end up in incinerators and are released to the atmosphere then circulate through the rest of the environment. Uh, this, this counts for about 30% of all the anthropogenic or, or human uh, induced mercury emissions into our environment. There's lots of things that maybe we're not aware of that have mercury in them. Uh, anything but the newer electronic programmable thermostats, for example, in your house have a big ball of mercury in them. They run on a mercury switch right down here that when you turn the thermostat, uh, it gets to a certain point, the mercury flows, closes an electric circuit, and your uh, furnace comes on. So anything, anything that looks like either of these uh, has got a, a very significant amount of mercury in it. When you switch over to an a, a electronic thermostat, don't throw that in the garbage. Don't have that end up in a landfill or an incinerator. Fluorescent bulbs are another household source of mercury, especially older ones. A, a typical uh, fluorescent bulb used to contain about 50 milligrams of mercury. It's not a very large amount until I, it doesn't sound like a large amount until I show you some figures a little later on here. But the modern ones are down to somewhere between about two and five milligrams, so it's a big improvement. But basically, fluorescent bulbs cannot work unless they have mercury in them to produce mercury vapor. And of course, most of us, if you're as old as I am, you have mercury in your mouth. You've got fill fillings which are about 50% mercury and 50% tin. Now, in Ontario, this is a rough inventory of what our, our uh, sources of mercury are. Oops. Uh, single biggest source, Ontario Hydro, and this, this is the fossil fuel combustion. Fossil fuels, principally coal, of course, and coal contains a very significant amount of mercury. So in addition to producing sulfur and acid rain, coal-fired power plants are the number one source of mercury. Now there's steps underway to improve the process of taking the mercury out of the coal before it's burnt. And this number is undoubtedly going to decrease in the future, especially if we actually do go ahead with the elimination of our coal-fired power plants. But it still is a, a major source. One of the speakers this morning mentioned cement production is a, is a big source of carbon dioxide. Well, the, the carbonate that's burnt to produce cement actually has a biological origin and most biological materials are very effective at accumulating mercury. And so cement production ends up releasing a lot of mercury into the atmosphere. And I mentioned municipal waste, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole string of, of uh, industrial and uh, municipal processes here that, that produce mercury or let mercury get into our environment. And Bill has talked a lot about ice cores, which is a really good introduction. I don't have to explain the whole value of looking at ice cores. This is one taken from a glacier in uh, the Rockies. And I use this as an example uh, because it's a little more interesting than most. In this particular case, it's in an area where there was a gold rush and mercury is, is used extensively in the gold mining process historically. And so, in addition to the elevation of mercury in the modern industrial times, you can actually pick out uh, things like the gold rush here because we can tell how old this layer of ice is. See the mercury levels being greatly elevated above the, the natural background. 
We can also pick out, most interestingly, the two, actually three major volcanic eruptions. Mount St. Helens, which was not that long ago that you'll, most of you will remember, but also the Krakatoa and the Tambora, which the two biggest known eruptions globally. These were both in Indonesia, a long way away, but they spread mercury globally. Nevertheless, we can see that uh, the whole industrial period here has mercury levels that are much, much greater than pre-industrial or background levels. It only takes a little bit. Uh, in fact, one gram of mercury, and a gram is a, is a very small amount. A gram is about a 28th of an ounce. That is enough mercury to contaminate a typical small Muskoka, Halliburton, Perry Sound lake. Uh, one teaspoon weighs 70 grams. It's very heavy, but 70 grams, which uh, one, in other words, one teaspoon is enough to contaminate 70 small lakes, and all the fish in them. Okay, so we're talking about very small amounts. A fluorescent, a fluorescent bulb containing 50 milligrams will contaminate 100 kilograms of lake trout, pike, bass, fish at the top end of the food chain, to levels of two to five uh, milligrams per kilogram, which puts them in a category where you should never eat them. Uh, that's uh, the mercury in one fluorescent bulb breaking. Uh, a broken thermometer, three grams, is enough to contaminate 6,000 kilograms of sport fish. And the average production in a, uh, a lake, and I live on one of the Kawartha lakes, which is you know, a moderate sized lake, uh, the annual fish production of the entire lake is, is probably less than that. So how, uh, how come we're not all dead, basically, if, if it's this bad? Well, the answer is that most of the mercury you see and that's emitted is emitted as the mercury metal form, the, the silver metallic liquid that you're used to thinking of as mercury. And although it's toxic, it's not incredibly toxic. Unlike, unlike the organic form of mercury, a particular compound called methylmercury, which can be produced by some bacteria and some chemical processes from this metallic mercury, methylmercury is a neurotoxin that has very, very serious effects. Uh, you may have heard of the Minamata. Minamata is famous in the environmental literature. Every student at university learns about this. Uh, it was one of the, the first and most serious contaminant episodes in, in the history of the 20th century. In this place, the city called Minamata, the harbor was contaminated by a chemical company with mercury, which was used uh, in a chemical process. I think it had something to do with uh, uh, pulp and paper, and uh, resulted in very, very serious human health issues. Uh, ultimately, 700 people died, and about 9,000 were uh, identified with permanent brain damage from this. And that's from simply because eating large amounts of fish, there's no direct intake of this compound, it's from eating large amounts of fish from, taken from the harbor that was polluted with the mercury. So how does it get to be a problem here? Well, mercury has another unique property in that it, it bioaccumulates very, very extensively. That is, as it is taken up at the bottom of the food chain, each step up through the food chain, the level of mercury increases drastically. It increases typically by at least a factor of 10, sometimes a factor of 100, each step through the food chain. So whereas the water itself can have exceptionally low levels, in fact, Bill talked about lead and how five parts per trillion was an incredibly low level of lead, and that was the background level they could find in the cleanest waters anywhere. 
if, if we had five parts per trillion mercury in our water, it would be an incredibly more serious problem than it already is. We don't find levels above, in even polluted areas, higher than about two or three parts per trillion. However, that two or three parts per trillion is translated into higher and higher levels as you go through the plants, the small animals that eat the microscopic plants, all the way up through the food chain, ultimately to the fish that eat other fish. So that level is typically uh, compounded by anywhere from a hundred thousand to a million fold by the time you get to the big fish. And the end result of that is when we look at our sport fish, for example, walleye in Ontario, and these are our Ontario data, data collected by the Ministry of the Environment and by the Ministry of Natural Resources. Walleye is, is one of our more popular sport fish, but they are a predator fish, so they're at the top of the food chain. They live on other fish. If we look at different sizes of fish, everything from the small fish to the, the very large fish, and we can categorize the mercury levels that are in these fish, bearing in mind that this level of a half to one part per million is already at a level that requires some restrictions on what you can eat. Uh, less than 0.5 is considered safe, and basically there's, there's very few fish in that category, period. By the time we get to the large fish, if we add these percentages, and the three different mercury levels, if we add up these percentages, we're, we're finding that something like 98% of the fish can't be eaten. In fact, we now know that there's, there's basically no walleye populations in the province that we, we don't have to restrict because of mercury levels. Wildlife are also affected, because fish eating wildlife in particular, uh, weight loss, reproductive problems, early death, these include uh, loons. There's, there's significant concern for the past 15 years about loon populations. And there, there are many uh, known instances uh, where they've identified mercury toxicity as the causative agent for the, the, the death of loons. It's particularly a problem right now on the East Coast in Nova Scotia, by the way. Uh, mink, the same thing. There's areas where the levels in mink are so high that we know the populations have, are decimated by the mercury, but also things like otter, eagles, hawks, etc., that have fish as part of their diet. Now, on the good side though, our mercury use has, has declined quite substantially, so that in the Great Lakes Basin, we've dropped our mercury use by about 75 or 80 percent in the last couple decades largely by taking it out of paint products. Mercury used to be used in most outdoor paints as a fungicide. And taking it out of agricultural products. Again, it was mercury compounds were used as uh, fungicides and mildew sites. These are no longer allowed. So this is positive, but on the, on the negative side, uh, that mercury is still there circulating. As I said, it's an element. It's not going to disappear. It will take decades if not centuries to, to eliminate the effect of what we've already put into the environment. Now acid rain, I think in, unless you've lived in another country for the last couple of decades, you, you've heard about acid rain, know a little bit about what it is and what it's done to the environment. Basically the sulfur oxides and to some extent nitrogen oxides emitted from uh, industrial processes, particularly the those involving burning of fossil fuels result in the production of sulfuric and nitric acid in the atmosphere. It gets into the rain, the snow falls back to the land. This was in the uh, 50s and 60s a, a considered a very localized problem in places like Sudbury. Uh, it was recognized in other parts of the world as a, as a major problem, the Scandinavia area for one back in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. And then following their initiative, Canada and the US became involved in, and recognized the extent of the problem in North America. And more recently in the 90s and this decade, it's become a major issue in places like China uh, and Japan. China, for example, is now uh, 
and this also relates to, to climate, China is building a coal-fired power plant a week now uh, for the past several years and plans to continue for at least the next five. Our energy sources in the province, of course fossil fuels have been important, they're declining now. Uh, we use hydroelectric and nuclear and our nuclear level during the, the time of, uh, this was uh, December 04. There was a period when the nuclear was uh, substantially lower than that as they went through the, uh, the uh, repairs and renovations at, uh, at Pickering and at the, the Bruce plant, but it's actually now increasing up into the 30 to 35% range and fossils fuel will decline. Well, there's our big, that's Nanticoke is our biggest fossil fuel source uh, or user right now. So why, why is this sulfuric acid a problem? It's a, it's a problem in certain parts of North America, principally the areas that are the kind of the chocolate brown color here. Anything that's brown here is very sensitive to, to acid rain. And by sensitive, I mean it doesn't contain the natural chemicals that counteract acids. Those natural chemicals are largely the, the carbonates, uh, limestone, dolomite, etc. These chemicals will, will neutralize any acid falling on them. If we overlay the zone in this olive color here, where acid deposition rates are very high because industry emissions are very high in this region, if we overlay that with the chocolate, we can look at the areas that are both sensitive and getting a lot of the, the acid. So when we do that, we can see that there's parts of Ontario and Quebec that are going to be in the, uh, the worst hit category. And some of the effects, this, this picture was not taken here in Ontario. I, this picture I took in the Czech Republic, an area that has received even worse levels of acid rain than we have. Uh, and this is not a picture in either a, uh, a flooded wetland area or a, uh, a place where there's been insects or something like that. This is, this is simply what a large part of the north west corner of the Czech Republic, the corner, the southwest corner of Poland, uh, part of East Germany. This is what they look like because of their levels of acid rain. There's, there are many, many areas where the forests are completely obliterated. On the aquatic side, there's many, many effects. Uh, uh, we know though that uh, the the higher, we measure acidity as a parameter called pH, and the lower the pH, the more acid there is. We know that low pH kills fish. We also know that there's an interaction between the acid and the soil and the rock in the lake's watershed that causes aluminum to be leached out of, out of the soil and rock and into the water. And that aluminum is very toxic to fish. It's, it's not terribly toxic to humans, but it's very toxic to anything that has gills, basically. And the aluminum increase because of acid rain kills fish. This picture was taken in Ontario, and this is what happens to, to lake trout on the top when they are, in effect, starved. Some of the effects are indirect because the other levels of the food chain are uh, affected, sometimes very severely. Sometimes the fish that depend, or other animals that depend on them no longer have an adequate food resource. So starvation can be the cause of uh, the environmental damage. So what has been done about it? Well, this of course was a big issue as I said, and a lot was done about it. There was a huge investment in, in reducing sulfur emissions, not so much nitrogen emissions, but, but sulfur. And in fact, if we look at this map of Eastern North America, the redder the color, the higher the level of acid deposition. So we're comparing the early 90s and the, the end of the 90s. If I had a picture that went back before 90, it would look even worse than this in the sense of redder. But you can see there has been significant decreases. And if we look at, for example, some 
data that data that were measured very near to here. This this is a a uh, there's a research station in uh, Muskoka that's run by the Ministry of the Environment, uh, where long-term measurements are made that have been crucial in the arguments about acid rain. Uh, this is a measure of how much acid there is in rain at that site. The, these measurements go back to the mid-70s, and they're continuing on today. But the only uh, point I want to make here is that if we look at the, the blue line here, this, this is a measure of sulfur, and that's a direct relationship with the amount of acid. And that has dropped from, and we'll ignore the units, the units here are, are we can just think of them in relative terms. We've dropped here down to a level that is about half as great. So our input of acid now is only about 50% of what it once was in this part of the world. Now if we look on a, on a broader scale, uh, emissions in uh, eastern Canada and, and uh, in the, the blue, we have decreased our national emissions from something like 4 million, 4 million tons of sulfur oxide down to about 1.6. We The lines here are caps that we set by, by legislation, and we're now well below that. And there are now regulations in place that will reduce this even further. So uh, problem is solved? Well, not, not quite solved. Because we have such sensitive areas, even more sensitive than we realized 25 years ago, we now know that things have improved, but they haven't improved enough. If this is a map that in effect shows you areas where the current new reduced level exceeds what the systems can stand. Anything in black or red means that we are still putting in more acid than the system can assimilate. Okay. So we still have a major part of, of the kind of central north Ontario and also Quebec, I'm not, not showing Quebec here, but Quebec as well and parts of Nova Scotia where the situation still persists. The other issue is, uh, besides maybe we haven't done enough, the other issue is has this decrease in input had the effect it was supposed to have anyway? And the answer is unfortunately no. Again, I won't worry about the, the units and the details here, but what I'm trying to show here is that the current conditions in lakes in Ontario are not as good as they're supposed to be. The, uh, we measure the amount of effect as how much sulfate there is because how much sulfate correlates directly with how much acid there is, then that sulfate in the wake should have followed this red line. It should have tracked that line. The sulfate should have dropped that much. But it, it hasn't. It's changed barely. It's changed maybe a third as much as we expected it to change 20 years ago when all these emission controls were put into place. And why? One, one reason why, the reason is shown here. If we again look at sulfur and we look at a stream as opposed to a lake, what we see is that in many, many years, the sulfate level stays at what I'm going to call a normal level. But in some specific years, there are astronomical jumps in the sulfur and acid that are coming out of the catchments or watersheds into the lakes. What is that doing? Well, that's basically keeping the lakes acidified. It's it preventing the recovery that we had anticipated. And how is that happening? These, these are data, this, this lake, by the way, is called Plastic Lake. This is not a joke uh, of all the talk about plastics. The lake was named back, I understand, in about 1950 when plastic was considered the new miracle substance. And so this lake in Halliburton has been called Plastic Lake and we've worked on it for almost 30 years now. In any case, uh, what I'm trying to show with this figure is that if we look at on the one line, 
the amount of acid in the water, then compare it to a second line, which is how, which is a direct measure of how much drought there was, how dry it was, how hot it was. And there's a very, very strong relationship there. And if we delve into this a little further, what we found is that the weather patterns we have here, obviously very from day to day and year to year, but there is a, a global scale factor which can override our general climate for years at a time. And that's the El Nino phenomena. You, you all know how, you've you probably heard of El Nino and the effect it has, particularly on the west coast of North America and South America. It also has a pronounced effect here in Ontario, but something that people don't realize uh, quite as much. And the effect here is that whenever there's an El Nino out there in the Pacific Ocean, we get a drought three months, six months, 12 months later. We get a pronounced drought. And sometimes those droughts last two or three years. This is simply a, a diagram uh, that is a measure of the strength of El Ninos. The, the red, every time there's a red blotch here, that's an El Nino event. Uh, the, the concern now, of course, with climate change is that the frequency of El Ninos is, is apparently increasing. We've gone from an average of about one every seven years over the 1800s through the early 1900s, now ramping up to one every three or four years. And this is being attributed to changes in the, the climate cycle and the ocean currents uh, in the Pacific Ocean. How do these all tie together? Well, this is how they tie together. This is, this is a typical wetland on the Precambrian Shield. There's thousands of them, tens of thousands. In fact, Ontario is roughly 10% wetland. Okay? And every time there is a drought, our wetlands shrink. The water tables drop, the edges of the wetland dry up, and something happens that uh, causes all these environmental problems to get worse. What that is, is that the process of trapping and storing contaminants, which wetlands are actually very good at, they store acid rain, they store mercury, they store lead, they store many, many contaminants, but they only do it as long as they're saturated and the, the water in them is oxygen free. As soon as the water tables do, drop, all those contaminants in that ooze and that muck are put back in contact with the oxygen in the atmosphere and they wash right out and on down into our lakes. And that is, that is why our recovery has uh, been drastically delayed. That is why mercury is linked to this whole issue because these events are now putting uh, pulsing mercury out of the wetlands into the lakes. And we, uh, we did some what are called simulations where we, we develop a model that is used to predict what will happen under these kinds of circumstances. So this, for example, is, is our best information on sulfur emissions in eastern North America from 1850 to 2050. So some of the old years here are estimated. Some of these are measured, and these are predicted based on what we plan to do with emission controls. Okay. When we look at what we can expect then, uh, in terms of recovery of lakes, if, and I'll just look at the very top figure here, again, ignore the units, but just track this solid dark line. That's what we expect the sulfur levels or the acid levels in the lake to do over the next, well, 100 years. If we take the average uh, climate of 50 years ago. Now, however, if we throw in these droughts, these, and these droughts, at, even at the current frequency, without increasing that frequency, what happens is shown in the line up here. 
we have many, many periods where the acid levels go way back up again, over and over and over again. The end result is recovery and under these conditions is virtually non-existent. Well, one last uh, slide or two showing you or talking about how this links into future climate change. If we take some of the big, big global scale climate models, and Canada is a world leader in developing those, by the way, and make some predictions. And we made some predictions because there's a meteorologic station at the Muskoka Airport near Gravenhurst where we could compare part of the record to existing data. We make a prediction based on our projected change in carbon dioxide levels that precipitation will actually increase a little. So we think, ah, oh, less droughts. But no, not so, and that's because temperature is going to increase even a lot more. And if you look at these figures, we're talking about, and these are not produced by uh, kind of lunatic fringe people making wild guesses. These are, these are the best estimates of the scientists in the federal government here. We're talking about a change in mean temperature of from 5 degrees to over 10 degrees Celsius. All the different lines are different models. But they all have the same general story. We're all talking about a massive warming. And that is going to offset, more than offset, the slight increase in precipitation. And what we'll have is less and less water, lowering water tables, drier wetlands, and less runoff. Well, let me just quickly summarize. The lakes have only recovered about half what we uh, expected in terms of the amount of acid they have. Uh, the droughts that follow these major climate fluctuations are the reason for this. And because they've resulted in the release of all the contaminants that wetlands have been able to trap back out into the natural environment. Yeah, okay. And then uh, finally, that uh, the patterns in lakes, and they all seem to be doing the same thing. They relate both to the change in sulfur deposition and to these climate effects. In other words, climate is uh, an overriding factor uh, that has to be considered looking at all these different issues. We need lower emission targets for sulfur and nitrogen, and we need to build uh, the future changes in climate into our thinking. Thanks for your attention.